Hello and welcome to another Control Systems tutorial with me, Richard Pates. Today we're going to put the last four lectures together and design what's called an output feedback controller. This name is rather misleading. All controllers generally work on outputs of something, but it's so named to indicate that it's actually going to be the combination of the state feedback controller that we designed a few lectures ago and the state observer that we considered last time. The way we're going to combine these two things is we're going to use the state observer to produce an estimate of our state x hat and then use that state estimate as the input to our state feedback controller. We will talk about how to do this and also provide some analysis of the resulting feedback system. To illustrate the process of designing this output feedback controller by example, and the example that we're going to consider is the inverted pendulum system illustrated here. The inverted pendulum consists of two moving parts. Uh, the cart, which is given by this white box, which is free to slide along this rod, and the pendulum itself, which is free to rotate around this pivot point here. We're going to assume that we can apply a force to the cart, as shown um, here. Now, this force can actually push the cart in either direction, depending on the sign of F. So we've illustrated it on the left-hand side here, but uh, F can actually push the cart in either direction. And what we're going to try to do is design a control system to pick our input force F to try to keep the pendulum balanced in the upright position. And we can characterize this objective with a variable theta. So theta measures the angle that the pendulum makes from the vertical, and it's our objective to uh, pick the input force F to keep the pendulum um, in a position so that its angle theta is approximately zero. To design this system, we need to take some measurements, and we're going to assume that theta is what we can measure. So our control problem is we can measure theta. How can we design a control system to choose F to keep theta small? To do this, we need a dynamical model of uh, the system here. And this is not going to be a lecture on dynamical modeling. So I'm just going to write down the model that we're going to uh, consider. And we'll give a brief sketch of where that comes from after doing that. But uh, for the purpose of today's lecture, we're going to assume this uh, dynamical model accurately describes the dynamics of the pendulum. Um, so what do we need first? We need a state variable, and we're going to assume that the state of this whole system can be characterized by the state variable theta dot theta. And we're going to say that the dynamics obeys the following state space model. So first of all, we have x dot is equal to ax plus bu. So that's x dot here is equal to a. And we're going to assume that the a matrix is 0, 1, 1, 0 times x, and here we have theta dot and theta, and then plus b u. So we're going to assume that the b matrix is minus 1 naught times u, and our input is the force f. So this, this is our state variable, or that's our x dot term even. This is our x term. This is our control input u, and our output and our measurement is equal to theta. So y is equal to theta, um, or y is equal to cx. So the c matrix is 0, 1, theta dot theta as so. Now, a few quick comments. Um, well, first of all, this is a linear model and this is a nonlinear system. So this model will only give us a reasonable approximation of the dynamics as long as we can keep theta small. And also, the state seems to be far too low dimension. What about the position of the cart? And it's definitely true if we modeled things properly, uh, the state space model would be larger and include more states. But if we just use this simple model here, um, it'll keep the calculations um, easier. And it's not completely random, this model here. And to give you an idea of where it comes from, um, let's 
imagine that we apply Newton's law along uh, in this direction as shown here. So why do we do this? Um, well, we need, in order to apply Newton's law in this direction, we need to draw on some forces. So we have, what are the forces acting on this uh, mass at the top of the pendulum? So let's say that the mass at the top of the pendulum is M, and then we have a tension force coming from the rod that's being transferred down onto the cart. And we also have our acceleration due to gravity. So we have an MG force like that. And when we apply um, Newton's law in this direction, actually it's only this mg force, this is the only one that's uh, contributing. And what's its contribution in this direction? Well, if this angle is theta, this angle here is theta, which means that this one is not theta, which means that this angle here is theta. So, um, the force is given by mg sine theta. And what's this equal to? Well, this is equal to m multiplied by the acceleration. And now the acceleration has two components. We have a component coming from the rotation of the pendulum around this pivot point. So what's that acceleration? Well, if the length of the pendulum is l, it's given by l theta double dot and then to this we're going to add um, the side to side um, so we have an acceleration of this point corresponding to the cart moving from side to side and so if we introduce another variable z which describes the position of the cart in this direction this term will be z double dot cos theta. So we have to resolve this z um, component here into the direction in which we're applying f equals ma. And if we do that, we arrive at this model. And now we make a small angle approximation, or we linearize this. And uh, we find, well, first of all, we find these m's cancel. And then we find that g theta is approximately equal to L theta double dot plus Z double dot. And if we rearrange this slightly and just assume for simplicity that L and G are equal to one or equivalently that we've rescaled all our variables in some clever way, we get that theta double dot minus theta approximately equals z double dot. And I shouldn't have moved this theta over here. Let's scrub it out and put our theta here. And we see that this is actually uncannily, ooh, we've lost a minus sign somewhere. Yeah, there should be a minus sign here. And we see that uh, this equation looks uncannily similar to the first equation in our state space model. This is reading that theta double dot is equal to no theta dot plus theta. So theta double dot is approximately equal to theta. And then minus one times f, and here we've got minus one times z double dot. So to arrive at this model, we're basically assuming that the force we apply here translates directly into the acceleration of z double dot. This is um, obviously an a, assumption. And if we did things properly, we would have to go and apply Newton's law all over various other bits of this pendulum. And we, we'd actually end up with a slightly larger state space model. Um, but this will do for our purposes today. So the first equation in our state space model is just the linearization of this application of Newton's law. And the second equation in our state space model is just saying that theta dot is equal to theta dot. So that's obviously fine. Our first step is going to be to, to design a state observer for the system. We're going to try to design a state observer which has got um, poles in the locations minus two, minus two. So how do we do this? Well, in the previous lecture, we saw that we have to find a target polynomial 
which has these poles, and set that target polynomial equal to the determinant of SI minus A minus LC. Since the, uh, the zeros of this polynomial gave us the poles of our state observer. So we need to make this thing equal to our polynomial, which has got these two roots. So what polynomial has those two roots? Well, it's the polynomial s plus 2 squared. Or after we expand, we get s squared plus 4s plus 4. So our objective is to design this matrix L such that this equation holds. And to do this, the first thing we need to do is form this matrix, then take the determinant, and then match coefficients. So first steps first, make this matrix. So what do we have? Well, S times the identity is simply this. And from this, we subtract A, which was given by 0, 1, 1, 0, and then minus LC. So we know that our C matrix was 0, 1. And what is our L matrix? Well, we need to choose it to make the dimensions compatible. So we need to put something in here that will give us a two by two matrix. And so our L matrix has got two unknowns, L1 and L2. Now we need to simplify this a bit. So in the one one corner, we just have S and that's it. In the one two position where well, we have zero, minus one, minus L1. So minus one, minus L1. In the 2, 1 position, we have 0, minus 1, minus 0, so just minus 1. And in the 2, 2 position, we have S minus 0, minus L2. So S minus L2. And we need to take the determinant of this matrix. So what do we get? We get that this is equal to, uh, where shall I put it? I'll just put it here. So this multiplied by this, that's S, multiplied by S minus L, oh, that's a disastrous L, S minus L2, and from that we subtract the product of this, all of these minus signs will go, so we end up subtracting 1 plus L1. And now we've been rather fortunate, um, if we just expand this out, we get that s squared minus l2s minus 1 plus l1. Well, we just need to pick l1 and l2 so that the coefficient in front of the s term matches the 4 in our target polynomial and uh, the l1, um, so the constant term matches the constant term in our uh, target polynomial. And we see immediately that we can achieve this by setting L2 is equal to minus 4. And similarly, we need to set L1 equal to minus 5. If I set L1 to minus 5, this whole thing becomes minus 4. Minus minus 4 equals 4 that we desired. So the state feedback matrix L given by minus 5, minus 4, will give us an observer which has got poles in the position minus 2, minus 2. But how do we implement our state observer? Uh, well, we saw in the previous lecture that the state observer could be described by the system x hat dot is equal to a x hat plus b u plus l and then here we had y hat minus y, but y hat, this was just c times x hat. So this is the description of our state observer and this variable x hat, this is our estimate of the state. So x hat of t is our estimate of the state at time t. The a, b and c matrices come from the state space model of the open loop system and the matrix L, well, that was the matrix that we designed on the previous slide. So how can we draw on this uh, 
implementation into our block diagram to start to build up our um, control scheme. Well, the state observer takes as its input um, our control input u and our measurement y. So it uses this signal u in the block diagram and this signal y, so the inputs and outputs of the plant. Um, I've added on some extra signals, d and n. These are just going to be assumed equal to zero for all of the discussions in this lecture, but you could actually imagine that our plant was subject to some unknown disturbances and our measurements why was subject to some unknown noises, uh, noise. And um, the effect of adding these terms is just to add in these signals into the block diagram as shown. But now we're just going to try to build up the block diagram that describes this system here. And to do this, I'm just going to draw a few pieces on. So I'm going to put on a matrix B. I'm going to put in another summing junction. I'm not going to another summing junction like this. We're going to have stuff flowing into the summing junction. I'm going to put a matrix L. I'm going to put a minus one. And let's add in another summing junction like that. OK, so what have I managed to describe? Well, flowing into this summing junction, I have the signal BU and I have the signal minus LY. So actually, I have the signal BU and also I have this minus LY. So I've got this term here. So I'm slowly beginning to build up the right hand side of this equation. And I'm just going to assume that I'm going to be successful in this endeavor. And so that the output of this summing junction, this is going to be x hat dot. So x hat dot is equal to stuff flowing in. And we found two of the pieces. So to complete the picture, what do we need? Well, we need something that depends on x hat. So if we add on an integrator like so, let's just make this line a little bit longer. So the integral of x hat dot is just x hat. So this integrator block will produce our signal x hat and we need an a x hat term. So that's good news. We can now take this put it through our matrix A and add this into our summing junction. So now we have this term and we're just missing the plus L Y hat, but Y hat is just C times X hat. So we can also create this by taking our X hat signal, passing it through a block C. So this is giving us the signal C X hat. And we just need to take this up into our summing junction. And this block diagram here, this describes um, our state observer. So this is describing the input output system from U and Y to our state estimate X hat. And we could compact this whole thing down into um, a transfer function that would map um, U and Y to X hat. And we also saw in the previous lecture that this transfer function was described by x hat of s is equal to s i minus a minus l c to the minus one. And that was all multiplied by b u minus l y. So this transfer function description here and this um, ODE description here, these are giving alternative characterizations of this block diagram representation of the state observer. Now that we've designed our state observer, let's design our state feedback matrix. We won't worry about any of the details of the implementation yet. We'll just focus on designing the K matrix exactly as we did um, during the lecture on state feedback. Now, we're going to design this K matrix to place some poles in the locations 
minus one, minus one. And in the electron state feedback, we saw that um, the pole locations we were interested in were given by the um, zeros of the polynomial determinant si minus a minus bk. So we can make the poles lie in these locations by making this polynomial equal to a polynomial which has its roots in the positions minus one, minus one. And what is such a polynomial? Well, it's simply s plus one squared. So this polynomial has two zeros and they're both in the position minus one. So our objective is given matrices A and B from the state space model of our system, find the matrix K so that this polynomial matches this polynomial. And so we'll just expand out this term on the right. And we get S squared plus 2S plus 1. So this is our target. And then the next thing we need to do is expand out this polynomial, which means we've got to find this matrix here. So what do we have? Well, we have S times the identity again. So that's this matrix here. And from this, we subtract the A matrix, which was 0, 1, 1, 0. And then we subtract the B matrix. And B was minus 1, 0. And we need to pick a K matrix with appropriate dimensions. In this case, K will have two entries, K1 and K2. And uh, let's just simplify this matrix down. So what do we get? Well, in the 1, 1 corner, we have S minus 0 minus minus K1. So that's S plus K1. In this position, we have minus 1, minus minus k2. So that's just k2 minus 1. In the 2, 1 position, well, we just have minus 1. And in the 2, 2 position, well, we're just going to have s. So this is the matrix that we need to take the determinant of. So we need to find this determinant here. So what do we get? Well, the determinant is this product minus this product. And so that's S plus K1 multiplied by S. And from that, we subtract minus 1 times K2 minus 1. So that's actually plus K2 minus 1. And we just expand this out, and we get S squared plus K1S plus K2 minus 1. And now to make this determinant polynomial equal to our target polynomial, we just need to pick the uh, numbers K1 and K2 so that the coefficients in front of the S term match and the, uh, the constants match. And to do this, we just need to pick K1 is equal to 2 and K2 is equal to 2. So the state feedback matrix K with the entries 2, 2, will place the eigenvalues of this matrix, uh, well, of the matrix A plus B, K, in the uh, positions minus 1, minus 1. And in the state feedback lecture, that corresponded to placing closed loop poles in particular locations. And now, in the rest of the lecture, we're going to work out how we should perform an implementation with this state feedback matrix and what that's going to mean in terms of closed loop poles and so on. So. Let's uh, press on with that. So how should we implement our state feedback? Well, in the state feedback lecture, we implemented things using the control law u is equal to kx. That is, we set our control input u equal to our state feedback matrix k, which we just found, multiplied by the value of the system state. However, we cannot implement this control law because we cannot measure the system state x anymore. We can only measure the output of the plant y. However, we have just designed a state observer to give ourselves an estimate of the state x hat. And we've done so to place the poles of the state observer in the left half plane. 
we saw in the uh, lecture on state feedback that this would guarantee that our state estimate x hat of t would be approximately equal to x of t. And this approximation would get better and better and better as time got larger and larger and larger. So a very natural thing to do would be to instead replace this state feedback control law with the, the control law u is equal to k x hat. After all, if x hat and x were very similar, this would be doing essentially the same thing. And this is exactly what we do. In terms of our block diagram, we can draw this on as follows. So the first thing we do is we draw on an extra block K containing our state feedback matrix that we just designed. And this is acting on our state estimate X hat, which is coming out of our observer. That's what this block describes. And the input to the observer was U and Y. It's just been compacted down to this transfer function here. And then we take this... Um, uh, k times x hat, and we pass it through a summing junction here. And this gives us our control input u. We put this summing junction in here because it's common to allow ourselves to add references or maybe even a pre-filter and a reference, just like we did in the state feedback lecture. And that's it. This is our implementation of the output feedback controller consisting first of a state observer and then of a state feedback controller. But why should this work? Our guarantees from the state feedback only applied when we applied the actual state feedback control or u is equal to kx. Here we're doing something different. However, Amazingly, we are guaranteed to get a closed loop system. And more than that, the poles of the closed loop system will be in exactly the locations which we placed poles in when we're designing our state observer and our state feedback controller. That is, that the poles of the closed loop system are given by the solutions of det si minus a minus lc is equal to zero. So these are the poles of the state observer and also the solutions of det si minus a minus bk is equal to zero. So these are the poles that we would have got if we'd applied the state feedback on the true state variable. But amazingly, we still get these poles even when applying it on the state estimate. So these are the closed loop poles. And um, on this slide, we're going to try to give a sketch of why this is true. And we're going to do this by finding the A matrix of the closed loop system. Um, and to do this, we need the state space models for both the system that we're controlling and the state observer. So let's just write those down to begin with. Um, so the model is given by x dot is equal to ax plus bu. And then we also have y is equal to cx. So this is the state space model of the thing that we're trying to control. And then our state observer obeys x hat dot. So the rate of change of our state estimate is equal to a plus lc x hat plus bu minus ly. And now this isn't quite the same as the way of writing out the set of equations that we saw earlier. Here we've eliminated the variable uh, y hat to put this more into more of a state space form. Um, if you're not sure about where this uh, equation is coming from, uh, go and check out the lecture on state observer design. But this is just a, another way of writing the equations for the state observer. And then our final equation is u is equal to k times x hat. This is our state feedback control law applied to the state estimate x hat. So these are all the equations describing our closed loop system. And if we basically, if we eliminate uh, u and y from these, um, so we eliminate some of the internal signals from our block diagram, we will get the A matrix of the closed loop system. So Let's just write out what we get. So the state of our closed loop system is given by the combination of the state of the plant and also the state of, of the observer. So we have a 
d by dt of x and x hat. So this is x dot for the closed loop system. And this is equal to some closed loop A matrix multiplied by the state x and x hat. And if we were to complete the state space model for um, the closed loop system, here we would have to add on a B matrix, which was multiplying our external inputs. And so the external inputs that we've considered so far have been a reference signal R, some disturbance acting on the plant, and some noise acting on our measurements here. So if we wanted to complete the state space model for um, the closed loop system, we would have a matrix. But in order to find the poles, we just need the A matrix. So this is the only piece that we're going to fill out. And so what goes in here? Well, um, we just basically need to rewrite this equation, but uh, with u and y eliminated. So if we do that, this first equation reads x dot is equal to ax plus b k x hat. So if I put an a and a b k in here, I described this first um, equation, but in closed loop. And now I just need to do the same with the second equation. This is a bit more complicated because I've got two extra terms to deal with. I've got a BU and a minus and a minus LY, but we've got equations to deal with both of those. So what do we get? Well, I have a BU term again, so I've got another. Um, oh no, let's put this minus LY term in here. So this minus LY becomes minus LCX. So minus LC. And then the bit that depends on x hat, well, that's a plus lc plus bk. a plus lc plus bk. And this is it. This is the A matrix of our closed loop system. And the claim is that the eigenvalues of this matrix are equal to um, the solutions of these two equations here. Now, it's not really clear how we would go from eigenvalues of this to these two determinant equations. Um, and to make things clearer, it actually helps um, if we perform a coordinate transformation. We're going to perform a coordinate transformation on um, our state variable um, to rewrite this in terms of a new state variable, which will make things more obvious. And the new state variable that we're going to consider is going to be given by x. So we're going to keep our first state coordinate the same, but we're going to modify our second one. And what are we going to change it to? Well, we're going to change it to x hat minus x. And um, the rationale for doing this is very similar to um, the rationale for explaining why the state observer worked. In the electron state observers, we found out that when we analyzed our system in this coordinate that described the difference between our state estimate and our state, so this is what we called E in that lecture, we found that it obeyed the very simple differential equation E dot is equal to A plus L C E. And this is how we understood basically that our state observer was working we were able to place the eigenvalues of this matrix to lie in the left half plane, meaning that E dot would decay to zero, which, mean, uh, which in turn meant that X hat would become equal to X as time got larger and larger, or get closer and closer as time got larger and larger. So we're just going to rewrite this same system of, of equations um, in terms of our new coordinate system. So how is that going to look? Well. After we do it, we're going to have a d by dt um, in our, our coordinates. So we're going to have an x and an e, like so. And what do these things equal? Well, we're going to have a new A matrix that acts on our transformed state variable. And all we need to do is work out what, uh, well, this 
becomes when we shift things into our new set of coordinates. Well, we've already done this bottom one. We did this on the, um, the lecture on state observers. So I know I have a zero and an A plus L C in here. If you're not sure where this comes from, just go back to that lecture. Um, so we just have to deal with this first equation here. So how can we modify things to get end up in our new coordinates? Well, the key equation to look at is this one here. So what does this equal? Well, this is equal to A X plus B K X hat. That's what we had before. But we can rewrite this uh, just by adding and subtracting some stuff. So this is equal to AX plus B K X hat. And then we're just going to subtract off B K X and add it on again. So we haven't changed anything by doing this, but we have seen a way to get access to our um, new state variable because I can simplify this so that it reads a plus bk multiplied by x. So that's this term and this term. And to this, I now add this bk. And then here I have x hat minus x. So that's just these two terms here. And this is precisely our new state variable, e. So when written in terms of our new coordinates, this is what our first equation comes as uh, becomes. So we can just fill that in. I have an a plus b k. And then here I have a b k. OK, this looks a little bit simpler. I've managed to get a zero in this coordinate here. But why does this make it easier to see that the eigenvalues of our closed loop A matrix are equal to these eigenvalues here? Well, it's not completely obvious yet, but um, let's just imagine trying to solve an eigenvalue equation when we have a triangular matrix like this. And I'm just going to put generic block names in. So let's say we have a matrix with block entries x, y, and z, like this. And x and z are square. So when mapping between this and this, we just set x is equal to a plus bk, and so on. And let's just see what happens when we multiply this equation by an arbitrary vector. What should we call it? Let's call it w, 0. So what does this equal? Well, this is equal to x times w. So x times w plus naught plus naught naught. So why is this useful? Well, we observe that multiplying this matrix by um, a vector like this corresponds to just multiplying x by the vector w. And so what does that mean? Well, it means that if w is an eigenvector of the matrix capital X, this thing is going to equal lambda times w, 0. So basically, if w is an eigenvector of x and lambda is the corresponding eigenvalue, then the vector w0 and the um, value lambda will also be an eigenvector, eigenvalue pair of this bigger block triangular matrix. So this tells us that all of the eigenvalues of A plus BK are also eigenvalues of this bigger block matrix. So actually, this is telling us that um, these uh, solutions here. These are eigenvalues of our big matrix here. So we've dealt with half of this. How do we get the other half? Well, we apply the same argument, but to the transposed matrix. Um, I won't bother to go through the steps, um, but basically an, a matrix, the, the transpose of a matrix has the same eigenvalues as the matrix itself. So we could just transpose this matrix apply the same argument. And what we'd find is that A plus LC, 
So the eigenvalues of A plus LC would also be the eigenvalues of this matrix, which would um, deal with this uh, second equation here. So writing things in this block uh, triangular form helps us to see that the eigenvalues of our state observer and of our state feedback give us the poles in closed loop. And this concept is sometimes referred to as the separation principle. And this is actually at the heart of many more advanced um, methods from control system design. It's very common that given an output feedback problem, you're able to split it into a problem of observer design and also design of a state feedback controller. So this is this has worked for this pole placement method that we've seen today, but this will actually be a more common theme um, that you'll see if you take uh, more advanced control courses in the future. That's it. That's how to combine a state observer and a state feedback controller. So what did we do? We uh, first designed a state observer, which amounted to picking a matrix L. So to design the state observer, we had to pick the matrix L. And the way we did this was to place the poles of A plus L C, just as we did when designing the state observer before. Um, this state observer could then be implemented based only on uh, using knowledge of our control input U, which we're free to choose, and our measurement Y. And it was implemented according to the scheme X hat dot is equal to A plus L C or multiplied by x hat plus b u minus l y. So these were the equations describing our state observer, and this would give us our estimate of the state x hat. We then combined this with a state feedback controller. In previous lectures, we designed state, uh, state feedback controllers u is equal to kx. However, we're not able to do that in this setting because we cannot measure the state x. So instead, we used our state estimate. That is, we set u is equal to k times x hat instead. The rationale for this was that if we've designed a good state observer, then x hat should be pretty close to the true value of our system state x. And together, all of these equations describe the uh, control scheme that we implemented. So first we estimated x hat using our state observer, and then we closed the loop using our state feedback matrix k um, to set our control input u equal to k times x hat. Um, so that's how we did it. And the amazing thing was, uh, was that the closed loop poles for this system were just given by exactly the closed loop poles of the state observer and the closed loop poles that we would have obtained if we were able to implement the actual state feedback control law based on the true state x, not just the state estimate x hat. That is, the closed loop poles for this feedback system are given by the solutions of det si minus a minus lc is equal to zero, so the closed loop poles of our state observer, and also the solutions of det si minus a minus bk is equal to zero. So the locations of the closed loop poles, had we been able to implement the state feedback law, u is equal to kx. And this was our first sort of encounter with this concept of the separation principle that will be running through many key results in control theory. And there we go. Thank you for your attention and see you next time.